Mantor Ministries presents the Mantor Guy Podcast. We may talk about football. We could mention bacon. We might reference Rocky movies. We'll probably discuss the Mantor conferences, but we'll definitely talk about how to grow in our walk with God. Here's your host, the Mantor Guy, Jamie Holden. Hey guys, welcome back to the Mentor Guy Podcast. Jamie Holden here, and I'm so happy you took time to join us once again this week. Well, guys, this week we want to preview the upcoming fall conference that's going to be happening in the Pendel Potomac District. This year, the conference's theme is 360 Man Be Audacious. It's going to be taking place on October 15th and 16th at Trinity Life in Lutherville, Maryland. And on Saturday morning session, they're going to be having one of the speakers is Mark. Batterson. So in order to get you excited and pumped up about this conference, we wanted to bring you one of Mark's past sessions from a past fall conference where Mark Batterson was one of the speakers. And we want to give you a chance to hear this message in anticipation of hearing him again at the conference. So enjoy this message as Mark Batterson brings us the word. Now if you have a Bible, I want you to turn over to Matthew chapter 19. Matthew chapter 19. And uh, we'll get there a moment. And uh, let's just take a moment. And uh, pray and ask the Lord what he has for us this morning. Uh, Holy Spirit, we, we just pause right here, right now. Um, if your spirit doesn't quicken this word, then we all are about to waste our time. But if your spirit would come and just hover in this place, like you hovered over the chaos in Genesis 1 and brought order and beauty out of it, I pray that your Holy Spirit would do the same thing in this very moment. I know that there are guys that their spirit is in chaos. That there's a relationship where there is chaos. That there is a work situation where there is chaos. But I pray that your Holy Spirit would come. Would come and bring order out of that chaos. Bring beauty. That you would come and bring creation. That you would come and do something so that we could say it is good. Visit us in this place this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, We'll get to Matthew 19 in just a moment. Let me tell you a story, paint a picture, give you a little bit of a backdrop this morning. A number of years ago, uh, I had uh, the opportunity to go on a uh, a missions trip to the Galapagos Islands. George, I, I see you right here, George Warren. Uh, George's daughter, Christina, is uh, part of our church in D.C., and, uh, and she speaks Spanish, so she, uh, she and Dido led this trip, and uh, yo hablo un poco español, un poco. <clears throat> so we, we had uh, this team, we went to, flew into Ecuador, and then, uh, and then to the Galapagos. There, there are 49 islands off of the coast of Ecuador, and I, I don't know how to describe it other than this. It's the closest thing to the Garden of Eden left on earth. Okay, the animals let people live there, is what I'm saying. Um, It it, it is like um, this unbelievable natural habitat. Um, I I remember one moment where there were these sea lions, okay, sea lions swimming um, in the ocean. And, And I had this brilliant idea of jumping in and swimming with them. Okay, I don't even know if that's safe, but I'm still here. Um, And so my son and I, we jump in the ocean and these sea lions just start swimming under us and around us. Like they're just playing games with us. I mean, it was one of the most thrilling experiences of my life, especially because we survived. Okay, there, there were these marine iguanas, the, these giant lizards that, 
I mean, you could get two feet from them, and, and they weren't intimidated at all. There, there were uh, these, these turtles, these tortugas that were 200 years old that were this big. And we, I mean, it was just, it was spectacular. And, and then um, we spent about 24 hours kind of out on the open ocean, if you will, going from island to island and, uh, and sharing the gospel. And, and the thing I remember were these pelicans that look like prehistoric pterodactyls. I mean, huge pelicans. And they would just circle the boats. And at any given moment, they would dive bomb into the ocean, go about 10 feet down and come up with breakfast in their beaks. Spectacular. It was unbelievable. So we left the Galapagos, flew home, and two weeks later, I took my family to the zoo. I don't know how to, I am ruined for zoos. And I'll tell you why, because they have these things called cages. And there's no chance of getting killed, which diminishes the excitement of the experience. <laughs> and so we're walking through the zoo, and we're going through the ape house. And, and there are these 400-pound gorillas on the other side of plexiglass, and a thought fires across my synapses, and the thought is this. I wonder if churches do to people what zoos do to animals. Well, what are you talking about? I wonder if we try to tame people in the name of of Christ, if, if we try um, to remove some of the risk, remove some of the, the, the danger, maybe make the message a little more palatable, make it a little bit easier, and by the time we're done, we've neutered the gospel. I want to tell you something. Jesus didn't die on the cross just to keep people safe. He died on the cross to make us Dangerous, to make us dangerous. I mean, read the Gospels, and uh, I tell you what, the, those, those disciples, those apostles, they were dangerous. And by the way, let me go on record, the will of God is not an insurance plan. Because how, how would you then explain 11 of the 12 apostles being martyred for their faith? It's not an insurance plan. And by the way, the only guy who survived, John, do you know how he survived? Well, they dropped him in a cauldron of boiling oil. But it didn't kill him. It just left him scarred for life. And so they put him on an island called Patmos. I'm glad they did because he wrote a book called Revelation. So he survived and we think died of natural causes um, maybe in his 90s. But he's the guy that got off easy. What I'm saying is the will of God is not an insurance plan. It's a dangerous plan. Um, read, read Hebrews chapter 11. Oh, how I wish it ended like halfway through. Because there's this wonderful description of people who conquered kingdoms and were raised from the dead and then you keep reading and it says there were people who were sought in two. Here's what I believe as, as a pastor. I, I believe that when, when we get to the end of our service and I pronounce a benediction, I, I want to believe that I'm sending, sending Dangerous people back into their natural habitat to wreak havoc on the enemy. <laughs> guys, guys, faithfulness, faithfulness is not holding the fort. Faithfulness is not breaking even. Faithfulness is making a difference with our lives. Now with that as a backdrop, I want to look at this story in Matthew chapter 19. It's a story about the rich young ruler. Here we go. Now a man came up to Jesus and asked, Teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal 
life. Let me stop right there. Is it okay if I do a little bit of teaching this morning? Can we handle that? Um, can, can I suggest that if you ask the wrong question, you're never going to get the right answer. Some of us are asking the wrong question. We're asking the wrong question. This is the wrong question. What good thing must I do to get eternal life? That's the wrong question, and I'll tell you why. Because you can't do enough good things to inherit eternal life. See, this is the fundamental misunderstanding of the gospel message. We live in a culture where a lot of people think that if you just do more good than bad, then the scales of justice kind of weigh out in your favor, but it's a lie. It's an insidious lie from the enemy because the Bible says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and that the wages of sin is death. And then James said, if you break the law at one point, you're guilty of breaking all of it. And you're saying, well, that doesn't sound like good news. No, 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 no. This is at the heart of the gospel. Please listen to what I'm about to say. You can't do enough good things to inherit eternal life. Re religion is about what you can do for God. Christianity is about what God has done for you in Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, God made him who had no sin to become sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God. Okay, let, let me give you my translation of that. It's almost like God says, here's the deal. Let me put the deal on the table. This is the deal. This is the gospel that I am offering to each one of you. Here's the deal. You take all of your sin debt, everything you've ever done wrong, you take all of that sin debt, are you ready for this, and then transfer it to my account, and I'll pay it in full. Now, how good is that? But that's only half the gospel. The, the other half is this. And then he says, and then why don't we do this? Why don't we take all the righteousness of Christ, and then let's transfer that to your account and give you credit. And then we'll call it even. What? Well, what kind of deal is that? I'll tell you what kind of deal that is. That's the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's why the gospel means good news. Our debt is paid in full, and then the righteousness of Christ is transferred to our account. It does not get any better than that. Now, here's why I want to push you a little bit, guys, because I want to tell you something. We, we under, I, I think part of us gets this, and, and we want to give God primary credit. But we want 1% credit. We want to be 1% of the equation. And what I want to tell you today is that you're 0% of the equation. That all you can do is simply receive this free gift of salvation. Now just to make sure, I want to make sure, because our lives point to the same destiny. And I want to tell you what it is. All of us will stand before the throne of God. And when you get before the throne of God, What's going to happen then? Because we better be ready for that moment. I want to tell you what's going to happen. You're not going to have to give an account for your sin. And I'll tell you why. Because your sin is nailed to the cross. In fact, can, can I just say this? Can we stop living as if Jesus is still nailed to the cross? He is not. He rose from the dead and he's seated at the right hand of the Father. Okay, the only thing nailed to the cross, Colossians 3, the only thing nailed to the cross is your sin. And now, now this is good. The, the hammer of God's mercy has no claw. He will never pull it back. Listen, you are forgiven. You are forgiven. And if we can learn to live that way, now the challenge is there's an accuser of the brethren. Right? Right? Who wants to remind you of everything you've ever done wrong over and over and over again. And I'll tell you why. He wants to do it so that you spend all of your emotional energy on past guilt. And you have nothing left over to love the people in your life right here, right now. And nothing left over to dream some God-sized dreams and to make a difference for the kingdom. 
But here's the good news. And this is interesting to me. Sometimes the accusations of the enemy are false. And when they are, we need to call it like we see it. He's a liar. He's the father of lies. When God forgives, God forgets. How amazing is that? So when you try to confess a sin that you've already confessed, you know what the Father says? Well, why did you remind me of that? I've forgotten it. Don't bring it back up. Let the past stay in the past. So there is an accuser of the brethren, but there's also an advocate. An advocate with God. The Father. And so when the day comes that I stand before the throne of God, before the Father, guess what? I don't stand in my sin because that's forgiven and forgotten. I stand in one thing, in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Come on, can we give God a hand for that? <laughs> Guys, let's not ask the wrong question. What good thing must I do to inherit eternal life? Wrong question. And if you're here today and you have never surrendered your life to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, this is your day. It's why you're here today. This is your moment. Verse 17. Why do you ask me about what is good, Jesus replied. There's only one who is good. If you want to enter life, obey the commandments. Now, I'm not going to preach on this, but, but notice this. It says, if you want to enter life. Okay, just a reminder right here. Sin is not about right and wrong. It's about life and death. When, when we sin, in fact, if you pick up the, the grave robber, I, I write about the Lazarus miracle and how it's a picture of what God has done for each one of us. Do, do you know that according to Jewish burial um, tradition, probably 100 pounds of grave clothes. And so I, I love the way Jesus calls him out, and then they take off those grave clothes. Can I suggest that when we sin, we wrap ourselves in grave clothes. We are buried alive. We are mummified by sin. But Jesus said, I came that you might have life and have it more abundantly. Well, well that word abundant, two-dimensional word. Qualitative, okay? And what it means by qualitative is more joy, more power, more purpose, more love, more grace, more of every good thing. And I'll tell you why. Because the greatest witness for the gospel is a life that's just simply been transformed by the, by the grace of God. So the people around us say, I want what he has. That's, that's the life of God within us. And then quantitative, a life that does not and Jesus said, I came that you might have life and have it more abundantly. And so this is very, very interesting because we think of the commandments as right and wrong, don't we? No, no, no. Don't, don't devalue what's happening here. If you want to enter life, if you want fullness of life, obey the commandments. How are we doing? Are we doing okay? Now I know I'm doing a little bit of teaching. I know it's early on a Saturday morning. Let's keep going. Which ones, the man inquired. And Jesus replied, do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not give false testimony. Honor your father and your mother and love your neighbor as yourself. Are you ready for verse 20? Are, are you ready for, this is unbelievable. This is one of the most unbelievable statements by a person in the scripture. This is incredible. This is incredible. Here's what the rich young ruler says. Are you ready? All these I have kept. What? Are you kidding? You must be the most religious person I've ever known. You're, you're telling me you have kept all of the commandments? And then he asks a question. What do I still lack? What is missing? What is missing? Now this is fascinating to me because here we have someone who seems to be absolutely the most religious person ever. But something is missing. You know what I've learned? Um, I've learned that there's a big difference between religion and a relationship with Jesus Christ. I have learned that there's a big difference between following the rules and following Jesus. And there are some people, you can go to church your entire life and still be a caged Christian. 
You can go to church your entire life and try to follow the rules, but that's not what it's about. Like, do, do you think God's ultimate plan and purpose for our life is to at least put in, you know, 60, 90 minutes on a Sunday, sitting in a pew? Like, is that his dream for us? Are, are you kidding me? No, no, we're a part of the redemptive story that he is writing in history. He has called us to so much more than that. Now listen, I better say it. Forsake not the assembly together yourselves. Okay, I'm a pastor. I love it when people come to church. Go to church. But if you think that's where the game is, no, 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 no. That's the locker room. That's the locker room. And then Monday through Friday, you've got to go out on the playing field and deliver. Now guys, dial in and, and I want you to hear what I'm about to say because I think that we have misconstrued the gospel. I think that we practice what I would call holiness by subtraction. Stick with me. Goodness is not the absence of badness. You can do nothing wrong and still do nothing. Isn't that what's happening here? He's not doing anything wrong, but he's not doing anything right. And that's why he doesn't feel the surge of adrenaline it comes when we step out in faith and live by faith and follow in the footsteps of the Lord Jesus Christ. He has called us not just to play defense, but to play offense. To play offense for the game. Now, let me give you a couple of theological terms. There are sins of commission. A sin of commission is doing something you shouldn't have done. Don't do it. You know, I, I believe that we should not commit sins of commission. But, but many of us, like, that's all we're thinking about. There are sins of omission. What you would have, could have, and should have done. The promptings of the Holy Spirit. Where the Holy Spirit gives us the elbow and we know we're supposed to share a word of encouragement. We pass someone on the street in D.C. Um, we pass someone on the street and there's someone that, that we know we need to respond to them in love and compassion. Maybe help meet a need. But we just walk right by. Um, your workplace. Your workplace is your congregation. It's your church. It's your pulpit. Listen, maybe God has you in your workplace, not just to earn a paycheck, but to pastor the people that you're rubbing shoulders with. It's the sins of omission. Here's what I would suggest. Everybody in this place has tremendous God-given potential. The potential to make such a difference. But if all we're trying to do is break even and not do anything wrong, we're, we're missing it. Listen, as a dad, I love it when my kids make a decision to not do something wrong. But that's not my ultimate dream for my, my three children. I want them to fan into flame the gift of God that's within them. I want to see them make a difference in their generation. So the thing that breaks my heart is when my kids aren't tapping into their full potential. Can I tell you what breaks the heart of our Heavenly Father? When we waste the time, talent, and treasure that He's given to us. When we just spend it on selfish purposes, something that, that isn't even going to make the cut, that's going to be destroyed by fire because it's hay and stubble. Listen, God has dreams for you that are way beyond what you could ever imagine, but we've got to play offense. Now, what does that have to do with the rich young ruler? I want to tell you something. I want you to hear what I'm about to say. I think this is one of the saddest stories in the Bible, and I'm going to tell you why. Okay? Um, it's called the rich young ruler. Now, I went to seminary, and they taught me in seminary that that means that he was rich, he was young, and a ruler. why you go to seminary <laughs> stuff like that you know it's incredible but a day is going to come when he's the rich old ruler 
and his life comes to an end. And he looks back on his life. And he has to ask the question, did my life make a difference? Did my life count? Did I live my life the way I could have and should have? And, and, and I bet there was a moment at the very end of his life where he realized that he had everything and it was nothing. Why? Because, because he wouldn't give it up. Because he, he spent it all on selfish purposes. Spent it all on himself. But, but listen to me. Think about the difference he could have made. Rich could have leveraged his wealth for kingdom causes. Young had his whole life in front of him. Had the energy, had the ability to make a difference and ruler. He had power and influence that he could have used for God. He could have touched nations. But he did nothing. Why? I'll tell you why. Verse 21. Jesus answered, if you want to be perfect, go and sell your possessions and give to the poor. And you will have treasure in heaven, then come follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sad because he had great wealth. Let's keep it real this morning. How many of you have ever read this story and felt a little bit bad for the rich young ruler? You see your hands. Do you know what I'm saying? Because how could Jesus ask him to give all of his possessions to the poor, right? See, if I was one of the disciples, forgive me for even saying this, I probably would have pulled Jesus aside. You might want to start with the tithe. <laughs> Why don't we start with 10%? Like, are you sure you want to go the whole way? Like, all of it? His name reveals something. Let, let me ask you a question, guys. Is there anything that you find your identity and security in outside of the Lord Jesus Christ? We'll be right back with more after this break. I know you're going to dig this. Like what you're hearing? Head over to iTunes to subscribe, rate, and leave a review. Thanks. Men of God, we can't keep burning daylight. It's time to rise and shine. Mantor Ministry presents Burning Daylight, the Godly Man's Call to Rise and Shine. This is the most important book we've released yet as we give a rallying cry to God's men to throw off all complacency and rise and shine. This book is designed to help you know what you believe, why you believe it, and how to recognize the false teaching of progressive Christianity so you don't fall into its trap. It's time we rise from our beds and shine bright to a dark world. Order your copy today at mantorministries.com slash burning daylight. No more burning daylight, men. It's time to rise and shine. Listen to the Mantor Guy podcast on the go via Apple Podcast and Google Play. Thanks. Pornography is affecting millions of men, including Christians. Have you seen the effects of porn on your church? Perhaps you feel at a loss when facing the destructive force of pornography. Covenant Eyes is here to help. We created Strive, an anonymous 21-day porn detox for men. Strive will educate and equip men with powerful weapons for this battle. Contact our team today and see how Covenant Eyes and Strive can equip the men in your church to defeat pornography for good. Mentor Guy Podcast, helping men grow in their walk with God. Have you been looking for a Bible study that you can work through with your wife? Maybe you want to do devotional time with your daughter. Guys, we have the answer for you. You can buy both the men's and women's edition of whatever it takes for $15. This amazing deal is only available at our Mentor Ministries online store. If you go to Amazon, it is $14.99 for just the men's version. So many men are buying both versions and going through them with their wives and daughters. 
Do not miss this opportunity. Take advantage of this amazing deal today at MantorMinistries.com and click on the online store button. Order your copy today at MantorMinistries.com. Welcome back to the Mantor, Mantor Guy Podcast. Podcast. Welcome back, guys, as we continue this powerful message together. Let, let me ask you a question, guys. Is there anything that you find your identity and security in outside of the Lord Jesus Christ? See, his name tells me, rich young ruler, it's his identity. His possessions are who he is. Like, it's all about things. It's all about the car he's driving. It's about the titles, the positions that he holds. He's the rich young ruler. He finds his identity in it, and he finds his security in it. I want to tell you something. Um, your greatest asset will become your greatest liability if you don't use it for God's purposes. I'm telling you guys, the blessing will become a curse. Jesus loved this man too much to let him live this kind of meaningless life. No, 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 I've got a higher purpose for you. Listen, you come follow me. So we feel bad for the rich young ruler because of what, of what Jesus asked him to give up. But then we fail to consider what he was putting on the table. There, there's a place in this story where we should gasp. And it's when Jesus says, follow me. That's where we, like, oh. Okay, is that not the opportunity of a lifetime? See, we, we read it, we assume it, we take it for granted. But this is unbelievable. The sinless son of God says, come follow me. Hang out with me. Are you kidding? Like, you want me to come hang out with you? Just be with you? See, I want to tell you something. Um, what, what we have here is a beautiful picture in contrast. What, what we have is a rich young ruler who says, I'm going to hang on to my possessions. And then we fail to consider what he was giving up. He was giving up the opportunity to follow Jesus. And then we have his disciples. And they did not hold on to their material possessions. They dropped their nets, didn't they? They dropped their nets and they followed Jesus. Can I just ask a question? Who won? Who won? Th think about this. The, 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 the average person in the first century never traveled outside a 30-mile radius of their birthplace. Think about that. What a tiny little existence. And, and so think of that as kind of their universe of experience. But, but what happens? Jesus says, go into all the world, all nations, and preach the gospel. This is 1,500 years before the age of exploration. And according to Eusebius, the church historian, these guys go all over the ancient world. They would have lived their entire life within a stone's throw of the Sea of Galilee. And it's like Jesus says, watch this. Let me blow up your tiny little world. Let me show you what real life is, what real adventure is. And he sends them to the corners of the ancient world. And they go and they make a difference for the gospel. Uh, think about this. The disciples had box seats to every sermon Jesus preached, and then they would hang out in the green room with him afterwards. <laughs> they witnessed all of his miracles, 34 distinct miracles in the Gospels, right about seven of them in the grave robber, but 34 distinct miracles. They experienced all of them, okay? They drank the water turned into wine, and they filleted the miraculous catch of fish and then ate the miracle. Like, what would, you, what would you give for an experience like that? Let me put it this way. They went hiking, sailing, camping, and fishing with the Son of God. Most of us spend most of our lives accumulating the wrong thing. Let me tell you a story and then we'll come in for closing, okay? 
Oh, this would have been 2007, probably seven years ago. Uh, we helped start a church in Ethiopia. Uh, it's now a thriving church. There's some of our closest friends uh, in the capital city of Addis Ababa. And, and so I was part of a team that went over to uh, visit the church, got to preach. Um, we built a mud hut. It was like Habitat for Humanity, Ethiopia style. Um, it was an incredible week. And at the end of this week of just serving and loving, um, they, they said, hey, on the last day of your trip, why don't you just enjoy God's creation, enjoy our country. Uh, there's a wonderful game park um, down Awash National Park. And they said, why, why don't we go and spend a day, and we'll do a, we'll do a game drive. We didn't kill anything, but we, we saw it. Um, and so they said, why don't you come, and we'll, and we'll do it. And uh, we were like two thumbs up. And so woke up on that Friday morning, and this caravan of Land Rovers, we headed out of the city, and when you get into the outback of Ethiopia, it's kind of a whole different animal. Um, so we're about two hours out of town, and, and we're hungry, and so we stop, and we have a little picnic lunch. Well, there's some cows grazing uh, nearby, and for some reason, cows in other countries are far more fascinating than American cows. And so we're taking pictures of the cows. It's not two minutes, but that uh, some Ethiopian shepherds, uh, Ethiopian shepherds carrying AK-47s come running at us full speed, and they're speaking in hark, so we have no idea, but they're visibly agitated. I want to tell you why, because if you take pictures of their cows, they want some cash. Oh yeah, we paid them. <laughs> we paid them. And then we got out of there, but... but have you ever had one of those experiences where in the moment it is absolutely terrifying, but the split second afterwards it was awesome? <laughs> I mean, we're driving away. I'm thinking, okay, right, we just got held up at gunpoint in Ethiopia. I'm living the life right now. Um, now, I'll tell you, my wife was not nearly as excited about that, that experience as I was. But, uh, so we kept driving, and at one point we go off-road, and there's a, uh, there's a natural spring heated by a volcano. Have you ever been in one of those? Like awesome, like a natural hot tub. 114 degrees. Um, I got in that hot tub, and I'm not going to lie, I wanted to get right, right back out, but I still, I have, I have male instincts, like I'm not going to be the first guy out. <laughs> not going to be the weak link here, and so, like we're in there, and, and none of the guys want to admit it, but we're dying, we're dying in there. It wasn't five minutes, it's so great, and one of the guys on our team fainted in the water. Now what made this even better is that another guy was filming. And when this guy fainted and plummeted to a certain death, camera didn't move. You may die, but we're at least gonna get it for posterity. We're gonna capture this whole thing right, right here, locked and loaded. Um, well, fortunately, someone else on the team with the gift of mercy, you know, rescued this guy. We laughed about that uh, forever. So we finally get to Awash National Park. I'm seeing animals. There are animals. I don't even know their names. I've never seen them in a zoo. Absolutely incredible. I'm on a Land Rover with the African sun setting, and we're just seeing all of these animals in their natural habitat. We get to our campsite. There are 80 baboons. Don't tell me God doesn't have a sense of humor. Just look at the backside of a baboon. And so we're, sorry, that was the wrong mental image, wasn't it? Uh, wow. Uh, and so we're sitting around a campfire, okay? And it was one of those moments where you can't not worship. You ever have one of those moments you can't not worship because you're just so overwhelmed by the presence of God, the goodness of God, the glory of God. And, and then to top it off, like we hear a lion roaring. 
We hope in the distance. <laughs> and that night, okay, I get in my pup tent. I want to tell you what I did. I took out my journal and I wanted to record every single moment of that day. And I'll tell you why. Because I didn't want to take any of it for granted. I wanted to give God thanks for every moment. And that's when I heard the still small voice of the Holy Spirit. Now I want you to know, I've never heard the audible voice of God. But I've heard the inaudible voice of God where you know it's not just thought, some thought that materialized in your, your mind. And I want to tell you what I believe the Holy Spirit said to me. He said this, don't accumulate possessions, accumulate experiences. Now stick with me, stick with me, because if you, if you mistranslate that, it's going to be so bad. I'm not talking about just doing things, going here, going there, and just accumulating experiences. I'm talking about the experiences that you accumulate when you just follow Jesus. Where are we going? Where are we headed? And so I go to Ethiopia, and we're just there to serve people, but Jesus kind of like a little bonus deal, right? Like, watch this. Let me let you enjoy. Listen, when you follow Jesus, he's going to take you places that you never, you could never get there. You're going to meet people you have no business meeting. You're going to do things you're not capable of. Why? Because, because it's Jesus. When you follow him, you're going to accumulate some experiences that will change your life. It'll change your life. Most of us spend most of our lives accumulating the wrong thing. Listen, guys, that's just the message today. That's the message of this story. Don't. Stop it. Quit accumulating the stuff that means nothing. I want to tell you something. When we stand before the throne of God, here's what I believe. This is my personal opinion, that our only regrets are going to be the time, talent, and treasure we didn't give back to God. Because we wasted it. We wasted it. Every ounce of energy, every second of time, every penny of money that we gave back to God. Now that's going to be our reward for eternity. That's the truth, and that's how we need to live our lives. Now there's a moment of doubt. There's a moment of doubt in the disciples. And, and let me read this, and then, then we'll be done. Peter, verse 27, we have left everything to follow you. What then will there be for us? Can, can you read the doubt in this question? Do you, do you, are you picking up what he's throwing down? It, it's almost like, okay, Jesus, the rich young ruler, ruler like, he, he seems to have everything. On paper, he has everything. And we've left everything. And I'm just wondering... Who's going to win because it seems like he's winning because he's got everything. And we've got nothing. And Jesus says, I tell you the truth, at the renewal of all things, when the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne, you have followed me, will also sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or fields, for my sake will receive a hundred times as much and will inherit eternal life. hundred times as much. hundred times as much. I experienced a miracle on this stage eight years ago. I'm going to forget this, so Tom, Bobby, remind me. Um, I want to share about the inverted gospel to end it. Um, eight years ago, had the privilege of speaking. Was, was anybody here eight years ago? You probably wouldn't remember me, but Tommy Barnett spoke that morning. Do you remember that? Seven, eight years ago? Um, that, that morning, um, I, I was feeling pretty fragile. For, for starters, uh, I have no business being on a stage with Tommy Barnett. Okay? Let me put that out there. I mean, this is a as a hero of the kingdom that served Jesus longer than I've been alive. What, I know nothing. Um, but I'd just written a book, In a Pit with a Lion on a Snowy Day. Now I knew that 97% uh, of books don't sell 5,000 copies. I'm going to tell you something. It's hard to write a book. I mean, there were so many early mornings. It was just, 
It's hard. Um, I like writing, but I love having written. <laughs> Past tense. I mean, I'm in a writing season now. I'm telling you, it just, it, it, ah, it sucks the life out of you. But then hopefully it's life-giving to the people who read it. And so, you know, I was feeling a little fragile. Like, this is my first book. I mean, first, first time authors, books usually don't sell 900 copies. I'm thinking to myself, like, oh, did I waste my time? Like, you know, it's great if my mom reads it. <laughs> but I sure would like to influence a few more, a few more people. And I, guys, I usually wouldn't share this. And I, I even second guess it because I want you to know my heart that a book sold is not a book sold to me. A book sold is a prayer answered. Do you hear my heart today? Like I pray that God would put the right book in the right hands, that it would be a miracle for the person who reads it. And so if you don't read it, praise God, because not, you're not ready to read it. And that's an answer to prayer too. But I remember thinking like, Lord, I, I sure would like to think that this book is going to influence more than 900 or 5,000 lives. And you remember what Tommy Barnett did that day? He, he asked us to come forward and said, if anybody wants a multiplication anointing, I want to pray for you. And I remember thinking to myself, this is just me keeping it real, like, is that even in the Bible? <laughs> but if Tommy Barnett is offering, like, I'm taking it. Um, and, and, and listen, I, I did discover, you, it's amazing how often the word blessing and multiply is used. Now, now hear my heart, I don't believe in a prosperity gospel. Anytime you add something to the gospel, you subtract from it. Because the gospel's as good as it can get. And honestly, the least reward for our giving is a material reward. Right? Um, I remember feeling a little awkward, like, I'm speaking next. But I know I want what he has. So I remember going forward that, that morning. And, and I prayed for a multiplication anointing, specifically on my books. I hadn't sold a book yet. I remember saying, God, I mustered all the faith I possibly could. I said, Lord, would you multiply in a pit with a lion on a snowy day and let it sell? Are you ready? All the faith I could muster was 25,000 copies. And I felt, I felt so foolish even putting that out there like, is this crazy? I'm crazy. This is crazy. I, I don't know how to explain what the Lord has done. Um, now written 11 books. Um, that, that first book, In a Pit with a Lion on a Snowy Day, um, sold half a million copies. Um, <laughs> And, and again, I, like, I, I don't really, I don't really want anybody to go out of here necessarily sharing this information, but um, the, the circle maker's done two and a half times that. I, here, here's what I'm saying. I, I'm not good enough. Now, I'm not smart enough and doggone it, people don't like me. No, no. <laughs> I'm not good enough. Do you know that, that when I was in graduate school, I took a little assessment, um, and, and it kind of graded you on different occupations, and my assessment, my potential for writing was well below average. God doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies the called. Listen to me. When I, when I sit down at a keyboard, and this is me kind of bearing my soul, I take my shoes off, because it's holy ground. And I don't type on a keyboard, I obey on it. I worship on it. And whatever comes out, I believe is something that then is something I put into God's hands, and I say, God, would you use it? Would you use it? I only have one explanation for what's happened. I think God answered the prayer here eight years ago. That he put a multiplication anointing. Now listen, I can blow it. I can still blow it. Because when God blesses you, if you don't turn around and bless others, it's a curse. 
And I want to tell you this, whatever you don't turn into praise turns into pride. So let's be very careful to give God all of the glory. He will not share his glory. But let's also be bold enough and humble enough to stand on the promises of God and believe that he's a God who can do a hundred times as much. Who can do a hundred times as much who is able to do immeasurably more than all you could ask or imagine according to his power that's at work within us. But guess what? Guess what, guys? you got to give it back to God. He, he cannot give back what you don't give away. But when you give it away, when you give it back to God, then God can say, watch this. Watch what I'm about to do. come in for a close. Either Jesus is Lord of all or he's not Lord at all. Guys, there's no middle ground. I don't find any middle ground in Scripture. It's the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Is there anything in your life that you're finding your identity in, your security in, that you haven't just surrendered to him? He said, God, here it is. And I'm, I, I think not, not just the crap in our lives, right? I'm not just talking about that. I mean, let's give that back to God too so that he can pay that sin debt. I'm talking about every gift, every asset, every talent, every opportunity, everything that God has given. to It's all from him and for him. So let's just lay it at the foot of the cross and give it back to God. Two minutes and this is the key thought. I put my faith in Christ when I was five years old. After watching a movie called The Hiding Place, a Billy Graham film. And if you asked me uh, up until I was 19 years old, I, I would certainly have told you I'm a Christ follower, that Jesus is in my heart, that I, that I know the Lord Jesus, that I'm saved. But the reality is this. I, I think for the first 19 years of my life, it wasn't really so much me following Jesus, I think what had happened was this. Please hear this. I think I had invited Jesus to follow me. That's the inverted gospel. I think that's what a lot of people in a lot of churches practice. Now, I didn't want to go anywhere without Jesus. Don't get me wrong. Like when I went into the classroom, especially a test I hadn't studied for, I wanted Jesus right, right there with me. Give me a word of knowledge, right? And when I stepped onto the basketball court, oh man, I wanted him right there at the free throw line with me, right? Oh Lord, help me, right? So I didn't want to go anywhere without, without Jesus. But it was more about him serving my purposes than me serving his purposes. Something happened when I was 19. Something's going to happen in your life today. Because I made a decision. It's not about Jesus following me. I made a decision to accept the invitation that was extended 2,000 years ago to a rich young ruler. And is extended to you today. I said, forget this thing. Forget this selfish spirituality that's all about me. See, we, we want to buy in without selling out. Guys, there's, there's only one way, all in. You, you got to go all in. And when you do, the game changes. I'm going to invite the band to come. I'm going to invite the band to come. And I want you to just, I want you to keep your eyes open because we're men. We can handle this. I want to ask a question today. How, how many of you are here today? And, and as I'm talking about the inverted gospel, a little twinge of conviction in your spirit. Man, I wonder. I wonder if I've had this thing backwards. Listen, I don't doubt that you're well-intentioned, that, that, like, desire to do the right things, or maybe it's been more about the rules than a relationship. But what I'm wondering specifically today, how many guys in the room that you would just kind of boldly, openly say, I think that I invited Jesus to follow me, and, and today, this day, Man, I, I want to make sure that I have accepted that invitation 
to follow Jesus Christ. I want you to put your hand up high so that we can see it. I want you to put your hands up. Now for many of us, this is not a, keep it up, this is not a first time confession. This is us just saying, man, I need to go all in. I need to make sure that I am, I am dialed in. Anybody else? Let me see your hands. Think about it. I want to rush this moment. Now, it's not about a raised hand, right? I mean, that, it's about something that happens in your heart. It's about a decision you make today. But here's what I believe. Here's what I believe. With your hand raised high today, October 18, 2014, it's a game changer. It's a new day. It's a different day. I want to commend you for your boldness, for saying, I, I want to, that's what I did when I was 19. I did it when I was 19. I want to pray for you right now. Lord, I thank you. God, I thank you for these hands that are lifted up. God, we just, we just, uh, Right now, everybody, with, with everybody, with your hands, just kind of in this posture of surrender to the Lord. Just kind of put your hands up to the Lord. God, right now, I pray that you would help us to just respond. Lord, Lord, if there is something that we're finding our identity or security in, that, that God, we would just put it at the foot of the cross. We put it at the foot of the cross. Lord, we respond to you. God, we, we want to make sure that we are completely surrendered to your Lordship. God, I thank you for the guys that are raising their hands right now and just saying, Lord, here I am. Lord, Lord this is me. God, I'm, I'm going after you. I'm pressing in. I'm pressing on right now, Lord. I pray your blessing. I pray your joy. I pray your peace. I pray your grace. I pray that right now the Spirit of God would quicken something in us so that, that we would mark this day. We would mark this day like a birthday. That we would mark this day as a day that's the first day of the rest of our lives. A new chapter. A new season. A new day. Forgive us, God, that... that our normal is so subnormal that normal seems abnormal. God, take us to a new place of surrender to you. This we pray in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Guys, here's what we're going to do. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to take just a couple of minutes, a couple of minutes, and uh, I, I, I'm just going to let you into my world. Okay, this is just me. From that point when I was 19 to this day, whenever an altar is opened up, like, I want to be the first person there. I want to be the first person just kind of hitting my knees because... I want to tell you something. I need more. I need God more today than I needed Him yesterday. The keen awareness of that, I, I can't even, I can't even really formulate words to describe it. I have such a desperate need need for Him. Now, Pastor Curtis knows this, and he says as, about as much as I do that um, if you stay humble and stay hungry, there's nothing that God cannot do in you or through you. And I found that the altar is often where God does alterations. Guys, I want to thank you for coming up here before we even, before we even open the altars. I love it. I love it. And uh, if you want, listen, if you want, you can make an altar right where you're at. You can do that. And, and God, God sees our heart. But, but today, as you stand, let's stand. As you stand, if you just feel like kind of just, like man, taking a little step of faith is a way of just... God, here I am, that there's something I need to give back to you. There's something that I need to, to lay down at the foot of the cross. Man, let's worship the Lord together. Let's just offer ourselves to Him. Let's spend a few moments at the altar. Let's let the Spirit of God, listen to me. Let's let the Spirit of God seal, seal in us. Seal in us the good work that He's begun in our hearts right here, right now. Let's worship the Lord together. The Mentor Guy's Final Thought. Mark always brings such a powerful challenge to the men, and I am really excited about hearing him share this year at the 360 Man Conference. And remember, Mark's going to be sharing in a Saturday morning session at the 360 Man Conference. 
And this conference is taking place on October 15th and 16th at Trinity Life in Lutherville, Maryland. Make sure that you get to this conference, guys. You do not want to miss it. You can find out more information about registration and the other speakers at 360man.org. And if for some reason you're unable to make it, you're not comfortable going to such a large event or for whatever reason, you can also become a satellite host church spot. You and a man in your church can get together at your church and you can watch it as a live stream together. So for more information about that, other registration information, or information about the speakers and location, visit 360man.org. You will not be disappointed by this year's 360 Man Conference. I encourage you, take part. And if you're there, stop by the Mantor Ministries display. I'd love to say hi. Well, guys, we're out of time for this week. Once again, thank you for listening. Please take a minute and give a five-star rating and review. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Also, head to MantorMinistries.com to learn about our um, upcoming conferences in 2022. You can learn about dates, locations. You can learn about our resources. You can read the first chapter of most of our books for free. You can read our newsletter. You can sign up for our year-long Bible reading plan. We have so much stuff for you guys at the Mantor Ministries website. So make sure to visit MantorMinistries.com today. But guys, once again, make sure you get to the 360 Men Conference. And thank you for joining us once again this week. We'll see you next time on the Mantor Guy Podcast. Thanks for listening to the Mantor Guy Podcast. Be sure to visit MantorMinistries.com to learn more about our books, men's ministry resources, and our Mantor Conferences. Hey guys, Jamie Holden here. Did you know that only 10% of churches have a healthy, thriving men's ministry? That's only 1 out of 10 churches. Well, my mission is to see this number become 100%. Join me in my work with HGUS Missions to help develop men's ministry in the local church. Become a monthly financial investor in the work God called me to do by going to mentorministries.com partner and clicking on the Give Online button. Together, we can see God continue to move among men. Hey guys, Mentor Guy Jamie Holden here. Are you looking for a speaker at your church or for your men's breakfast, or your next men's event, men's retreat, or men's conference? Well, why not bring me in to speak? God has been moving among men as I've been sharing an encouraging word of freedom and victory. We're seeing lives change, men being saved, people being set free, and guys, chains are being broken. So if your church has hurting men and women, contact me to come share this encouraging word of hope and victory to help you grow in your walk with God. The Mentor Guy Podcast, helping men grow in their walk with God.